In Module 3, Kenneth, John, and Dom will take you through some key security concepts including the CIA triad, access control, incidents response, and the security frameworks. You will be introduced to NIST, the U.S. National Institute for Standards and Technology. There is a link to the NIST cybersecurity framework for additional reading. We will go into more detail on NIST and the frameworks in a future course. Now, let's take a look at those concepts. In this video, you will learn to describe what is meant by confidentiality in the context of the CIA triad. In this video, we're going to talk about the key concepts on the cybersecurity world, especially something related to a term uh, that is commonly known as the CIA triad. First, we need to understand that, that these three letters uh, means everything in cybersecurity. The meaning of each of these letters is, uh, are actually this, C for confidentiality, I for integrity, and E for availability. Confidentiality is actually pretty simple. Uh, we deal with confidentiality uh, almost every day, and it means that we are going to keep the data keep the system, keep our you know, technology uh, asset or, te or technological asset uh, confidential or uh, prevent any disclosure of, of confidential data or confidential access from this computer, this system, uh, that document to non-authorized parties. So, uh, for example, uh, one confidential data that we normally use are uh, our personal information. Uh, not necessarily all the people that we know needs to understand or needs to know uh, all the data that we uh, keep confidential on our uh, computer, on our uh, um, cell phone, or something like that. So uh, in order to implement confidentiality in our world, in the cybersecurity world, we normally use encryption. Uh, encryption, we are going to talk about encryption in another video, but uh, encryption means that we are going to uh, use a cipher in order to prevent any confidential data to be exposed to the public or to uh, non-authorized. Uh, uh, other key elements that allow us to implement uh, confidentiality are, for example, authentication, access control, physical security, things that will allow us to maintain any uh, a certain level of restriction to our data, to our systems, to our technology uh, and our assets. In this video, you will learn to describe what is meant by integrity in the context of the CIA triad. The other concept that we're going to explore today is integrity. Integrity is actually something that is similar to confidentiality, but there are some differences. Uh, for example, Integrity is just the principle that all the data, all the information, all the uh, systems that we are going to use are not modified, are not uh, changed by any system, by any user, by uh, any person uh, in the transit or in the meantime that we are going to use that system. So, for example, if we're going to send an email from uh, our email client to our uh, company's uh, headquarters saying that we are going to uh, I don't know we're going to we're going to use a system to uh, to access uh, remotely uh, the computer of the client and we send on that email the, the software the VPN software that we are going to use one of the key concepts that integrity deals with is uh, the importance that the that mail that we're going to send, send is not going to be tampered, is not going to be modified in the transit. So basically, integrity deals with uh, with a process that each uh, the pieces of the information that we're going to send that we're going to receive are uh, the original pieces. How can we? implement how can we use uh, integrity in our uh, company, in our uh, cybersecurity life, we normally use uh, hashes. Uh, that, uh, that, that concept, the, hash, the hash concept is, is something uh, important, is something that we're going to explore in, uh, in some videos in the future. But uh, in the meantime, uh, the important part of the hashes is 
explain that the hash is an algorithm, is a mathematical algorithm that it's going to create like a signature of the file, of the uh, email, of the data that we are going to use. For example, and I just going to explore a couple of things here. So for example, if we go to internet, let's go to Google and we can go to hash generator online. Here we could, for example, uh, go to the second uh, link. Here, here is the URL, passwordgenerator.net. And here we are going to uh, enter a password, enter a text. Actually, we could add something like secure password. password. This secure password, if we uh, generate a hash algorithm using the SHA-256 uh, algorithm uh, or uh, mathematical encryption, we are going to uh, translate this, this word, the security, secure password word, into these numbers and letters. This uh, information, actually, if you use this secure word to log in into your, uh, for example, into your uh, uh, email account. If you go and try to, instead of use the secure password, you use these, these string here, these letters and numbers, you are going to be uh, rejected by the system. But in the cybersecurity world, these numbers, these keys, these, these letters and numbers means uh, that if somebody is going to use this password, the, the signature, the hash will be something like this. If, for example, if we change the D for our, for our S, for example, the, the hash totally change. So again, if we change the S for the D, the hash will be the same. So this is a clear example of what, what hash means. It's a procedure where the uh, a mathematical algorithm goes and generate a signature for, uh, in this case, for a word, but we can generate the signature for for a file, for something like, like a document, something like that. Uh, another example, probably more clear example, is something like this. We could go to Kali.org. This is a uh, Linux distribution where, uh, used by, normally by pen testers uh, to test uh, security in the uh, enterprise environment. But if we go here and we go to downloads, then download Kali Linux, we're going to see a lot of uh, links to download this Linux distribution. But one interesting uh, part here is this SHA-256 SIM. This is the algorithm, this is the hash that we, we need to uh, validate as soon as we download this Kali Linux Lite version of Kali. So for example, if we download this file, we start download, for example, here in HTTP, the file will be download. And as soon as the download finish, we could, or we should actually go to uh, something like this, um, hash file online. We could go to maybe here, file calculator. In this case, we are going to use, yeah. So this, this uh, site, md5, md5file.com, will allow us to drop files uh, and generate SHA algorithms or the SHA results for these six, sorry, five uh, different algorithms. This means that, for example, as soon as this download finish, if we upload the file here into this online, cal online calculator and we receive something different than this number in the SHA-256 sum, the file probably will be corrupted or the file suffers something in the trans in the transit between the Kali servers and our computer. So that's a clear example of how we could use hashes in the in the real world in the in the cybersecurity world. In this video, you will learn to describe what is meant by availability in the context of the CIA triad. And the last one uh, it's for availability. Availability means, uh, and actually we deal with availability every day, but means that any data should be uh, available always when it's needed. So a clear example of a lack of availability is uh, do not have any kind of backups for our data, for our systems. So what happens when, uh, when a cyber attack, for example, occurs and somebody download a ransomware in our 
uh, network and all the data from our computers, from our servers uh, are erased or are encrypted. Well, the easiest thing to do actually is go to our uh, backup and restore the data using the last available backup available or using the, the last uh, backup that we have on our system and restore everything and continue our life, continue our work as nothing happened. But in some occasions, these kind of, of, of processes, storing a backup or generating backups, it's something that is not necessarily common in most of the enterprises. So some technical implementations that we could use or we could uh, uh, yeah, use to, to implement or at availability in our network, in our systems, are rates. Rates are like these arrangement arrangements. These these technology is something that, uh, for example, will allow us to to keep or to install two, three, four, even actually I don't know thousands of of hard drives in our servers in our systems to backup or to add redundancy to into our uh, servers for our data. So, for example, if we have four different drives in our uh, file server and one drive uh, goes down because uh, a mechanical part broken, uh, well, doesn't matter. We have three different drives that has the same information and we could maintain the access to our data. Clusters, cluster, clusters are uh, a technology that allow us to maintain a different set of servers uh, working as, as one. So it's something similar as a rate, but on clusters, we are not dealing with hard drives. We're not dealing with drives. We're dealing with servers. ISP redundancy, obviously, is something important. Uh, what happens if, if we only have one internet connection to our company and something happened and that internet connection, connection goes down? Well, something important is in, in these days when we are using a lot of things on cloud, uh, probably it's a good idea to have an X or a second uh, ISP to to have internet in our in our uh, company, and obviously backups. Backups. We are, we already talked about backups and the, the things, the important things that we need to keep in mind as soon as we work with backups and restore data. In this video, you will learn to describe what is meant by non-repudiation and how it applies to the CIA triad. Another uh, term, another key term that we need to understand is something called non-repudiation. Non-repudiation is, is pretty simple. It's actually uh, a valid proof that the identity of the data, data, data send, uh, sender of the data receiver is, is not, uh, it's not modified, is not altered, uh, not even on the transit, but in the, uh, uh, in the origin of the, of the data. So, for example, uh, how could we use something or how could we, how could we implement some technology that uh, will allow us to understand if somebody sent an email that person is actually that person is is not an attacker from i don't know from another country trying to impersonate the person that sent the email so that that's something that we normally implement with digital signatures and obviously if we go uh, to our uh, for example in this specific scenario if we go if we go to our mail server we could also go to the logs and see if somebody for example if Kenneth sent an email to his boss saying that he quit so uh, if there is no logs if there is no digital signature on the on the on the receiver side that says that Kenneth sent this this email, that should be something important to keep in mind for the non repudiation concept. So as soon as the uh, Kenneth boss goes to Kenneth's office and says, "Hey, are you really quitting here?" That's something that in this scenario Kenneth could say, "Hey, uh, Kenneth could say like, "Hey, no." I, I'm actually not sending those emails. Somebody is trying to impersonate. So that's something that we're going to talk about in the future. How we how could we use encryption? How could we use a public uh, key infrastructure to generate digital signatures? And how could we understand logs in different systems? But uh, at this moment, it's important to understand this concept, the non-reputation concept. In this video, you will learn to describe various methods of ensuring effective access management to an organization's computing resources. 
So we're going to go over some key concepts. Now we're going to talk about authorization. Authorization is the process of allowing somebody to access a specific uh, object. There are different types of criteria. You could um, restrict access by groups, by time frames, or specific dates, also by physical location or transaction type. What this means is basically you could do, you could allow, in this case, subjects or people to access objects or files or directories based on specific groups. For example, the industry group will have access to more data than, for example, somebody on a different group, uh, as such, such as maybe a financial person in a different group, like a financial group or something like that. You could also restrict uh, access by time frame, meaning uh, from eight to five, people can access specific files, but uh, any attempt to access those files outside those time frames will, those, uh, will be denied. Also, a specific date, let's say Monday to Friday, those will be the days that the people working on site will be allowed to um, access those files. You could also restrict uh, the access to specific uh, objects or files or directories again by physical location. So, for example, you want people only located in the USA to access those files. Or you want people only outside the USA to access those type of uh, files or specific information. You could also restrict the access to transactions. Um, you don't want people to write in specific files, but maybe you want people to be able to read those files. Um, we need to talk about need to know as well. The need to know is the justification for somebody to request access to a specific data. If um, my specific job or my job duties require me to know something, and maybe that will be the justification for me to have access to a specific files and directories. And all of this is basically centralized on something that's called single sign-on. Um, this is a, a very widely used on enterprises. And what this does is basically you log, you log in once, and you and the, uh, the single sign-on will allow you access to websites or to different files with just a single one-time um, login process. There are some authentication concepts that we need to understand. First of all, it's the identity proof. On most systems, uh, they will ask you for a identity and authentication. To put an example, the username will be your identity proof. That's something that identifies you and only you. But you need, after identifying yourself, you need to authenticate that you are actually who you're saying you are. And basically, that's done through the password. So the password will give you authentication, and your username, username will give you identification. Kerberos, it's a protocol used to implement single sign-on. And there are some uh, mutual authentication, like CHAP. And these are uh, some type of uh, authentication processes that are used to communicate two systems. They rely on a secret key or a pre key. More specifically, in Active Directory, we, ha we have something called security ID. And this, uh, basically, it's a, it's a unique ID given to objects and subjects, meaning it's uh, an ID that identifies a person, and also it's able to identify an object, meaning, for example, a group, a specific group, or a specific file. Most of the operating systems um, that we know, it use discretionary access controls. Basically, uh, the, the discretionary access control is a type of uh, access control that allows the uh, users to give access to their own data to whomever they want. Meaning if I have a text file with a sensitive data, I'm responsible for who's allowed to view and edit that file because it's my file and it's discretionary to me to give that access to anyone that I, that I want to. In this video, you will learn to describe the management process of incident response, how it is implemented, and why it is important to an overall security schema. In this video, we are going to talk about incident response. Incident response is uh, a process, is a management process, uh, or a managed process that most of the today's companies are dealing with. 
it's actually something really, really important uh, because it will understand or it will uh, generate information about uh, incidents, about events or uh, errors or even attacks that uh, computer networks or networks at all are suffering. So this means that uh, as soon as somebody or something happened in our network that is not normal, that is something it, it, that is not expected by the sysadmin or by anyone in the company, uh, it will generate an incident. So how could we uh, take that incident? How could we take that event and try to understand what happened? How could we prevent uh, any new incident in the future? Or how could we restore the service or the data or the computer or the network as soon as possible? This, all of those concepts are uh, incident management. Obviously, there is a lot of uh, things and we are going to talk about those things now. So basically, there is some key components on the incident managing, management process. First of all, it's important to understand what is an event. Uh, an event obviously could be something something that is not normal, something that is not part of the normal behavior of the network or normal behavior of the company. But that actually is an incident. We are going to talk about incident in a couple of uh, minutes. But right now, an event could be something that changed the normal behavior of the system. Could be something uh, that could be program or not is something that change what is uh, the normal process on the company, on the network, on the computer, or uh, it will be something that, uh, for example, something like a access uh, control list update or a firewall uh, policy was uh, pushed or was update by some someone in the company or a logging event into the server. Could be something normal, could be something expected or not, but normally, and, and the common uh, criteria here is, is something that change uh, the normal behavior or change the normal process in the company, in the system, in the computer. Now we have the incident. The incident is the negative part of uh, the event. So for example, if somebody goes uh, log into the server and update the ACL, that's an event. Uh, that event could be uh, generated or, or could be something that is expected because there is a ticket that says that, uh, hey, the system uh, administrator needs to go to the server and update the ACL in order to get, uh, grant access to some part of the network or in order to grant access to the VPN user or something like that. But what happened if somebody detects that someone goes to the server, change the ACL, and disable or deny all the access to the servers in the company from the external network. So nobody from internet, nobody from the external network of the company can access the servers. That, that is an incident. So it's something that will uh, negatively impact the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the uh, security in the organization. Normally, those incidents impact the business in so different ways. So, for example, could impact the normal service of the of the company. Could impact the legal part of the company. Could impact the operational part of the company. The financial part of the company. Okay. Now, to deal with the incidents, we have the response team. The response team, commonly known as the CSERT, is the team that uh, will, first of all, in some occasions, identify the breach, identify the incident, will deal with process to resolve the incident and uh, resolve the issue that we are going, that we are having right now. So, for example, if somebody goes to the server, disable and uh, firewall policy, and nobody from the external network can access the internal network, the response team will try to fix that firewall policy and try to restore the access to the internal network of the, of the, of the company. Now, one important part of the response team is the investigation process. They need to understand what happened. They need to collect evidence. They need to maintain the chain of custody of that process, of that event, of that incident, in order to, in order to understand why this incident happened, who formed the action, and what they need to do 
uh, in the future to prevent these incidents to happen again. So that's uh, that's the quick explanation of what events, incidents, response team, and investigation means in the incident uh, management universe. In this video, you will learn to describe the key concepts of incident response, including e-discovery, use of automated systems, business continuity planning and disaster recovery, post-incident activities. There are some key concepts that we need to understand, uh, understand also. First, the e-discovery process is something uh, really, really important. We need to have our baseline regarding technologies and systems and assets that we are going to use in our systems, in our uh, companies. So the e-discovery process will uh, allow us to get the current st status of all the data, all the systems, all the uh, information that we're, we are dealing with in our computers, in our systems, in our network. Also will allow us to understand how could we control the data retention period and the backups of that data. Uh, not necessarily data, but we could also understand things like, for example, if this system, it's important, if we have this system uh, that will deals with a payroll uh, on monthly basis. Is this really important? Do we need to care about the the data retention here? Do we care? Uh, we de do we need to uh, to care about the backup? Do we need to care about uh, the restore of this system in case of any incident happen? So that's that's important process that e discovery process. Then we we have automated systems. We have a lot of things. Uh, right now, in our current environments, uh, current environments, we have uh, CMs like uh, Splunk, Curator, our site. Uh, we have uh, user behavior analytics. We have big data analysis. We have honeypots and honey tokens, artificial intelligence. We have a lot of things. Why we have a lot of things? Because we have a lot of assets. We have a lot of data. If we only have one computer in our company, probably will be easy for the response team to understand why uh, why an incident happened, how could we restore the service uh, affected, and why uh, this incident is happening again and again and again. But what about if we have uh, 1,000 computers, 100 servers, uh, 10 uh, different routers and systems? We need to correlate, we need to centralize all the data generated by, th by those systems and generate reports, generate useful data on that system, and more importantly, generate uh, incidents or generate automated incident alerts that could allow us or could uh, alert the incident response team that something has happened, even before the user or the company was affected by that incident. We have BCP and disaster recovery. recovery. BCP means a business continuity plan. And disaster recovery is something similar, but we're going to talk about uh, the main differences. The business continuity process is uh, a whole process, a whole plan that we need to implement in our company in order to prevent or in order to actually guide uh, not just the incident response team, but guide all the, all the, all the organization as soon as something happened. What happened when service was affected and that service won't be available for the external users until the next three, four hours. How our company will deal with that? How the client uh, server, uh, the, the systems, uh, or how the IT department will deal, deal with that? How the uh, uh, client service department will deal with uh, all the, the 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 calls that we're going that they are going to receive from different people outside to the organization. And uh, disaster recovery actually is the process that uh, we need to implement or we need to follow in order to be uh, to recover all the different areas uh, if a disaster occurs. Uh, by 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 the term disaster doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to be affected by a hurricane or by a tornado or something like that. It could be something like a cyber attack that will destroy all the data in our data center. How could we go and recover everything from our data center? How could we restore everything and the process that we need to implement, not just to recover that, but also to inform the authorities, to inform 
the CEO of the company or inform to the public that we are going to uh, have a service disrupted because we have a, an incident uh, that happened in our data center. And obviously, the, the last term that we are going to explore is the post incident. This post incident is, well, as soon as everything goes uh, okay, as soon as we recover everything, as soon as the service is now up and running, what what this incident happened? What is the root cause of this incident? Who did the the attack, for example? Who implement or who make the changes? Understand what is the difference between an error, what is the difference between a problem, and what is the difference between an incident? So the important part here is an error. It's something that happened on the system because uh, somebody make an error. So, for example, if you go to the to the to the uh, finance finance system and you type your bank account and instead of your bank account you type your name and you hit enter and the system crash because of that that's probably an error because the system handle uh poorly the input of the of the user into a key into a into a text box a problem it's something that is it's a, a number of errors that normally generates a problem. So if you detect that and you you update the system and you implement a patch to fix that input error, but what happened if you detect that somebody or another user goes into another part of the system and again, instead of numbers, they, they put letters and the system crash, uh, well, that could be a problem. The system could be could could have a problem uh, on um, on the input validation side, and an isolated incident could be something that well, it happened once. We don't know. We, we still don't know why it happened. But as soon as the user put numbers or put letters instead of numbers, the system crashed. But if we if we go and try to replicate the error, we will we'll try to replicate the same behavior. Uh, nothing happened. So that could be an isolated incident. The thing is, we need to understand, we need to investigate, and we need to uh, fully understand and analysis all the different types of of of, of errors, problems, and systems. Uh, error, error, sorry, error, problems, and incidents that we detect on our systems. But we need to understand what is an error, what is a problem, and what is a, an isolated incident. And uh, the next part of the post incident concept is well. Let's, let's us learn and the reports that we could generate from those uh, errors, problems, and incidents in order to understand, in order to learn what happened, how could we prevent those uh, events, and what happened if those events uh, happen again, how could we restore the service as soon as possible. In this video, you will learn to describe the cybersecurity incident response processes and the three phases of prepare, respond, and follow up. We have uh, how could, could we deal with the cybersecurity incident process? This is something that came from CREST. CREST actually is a good organization that uh, will have a lot of certifications, a lot of information regarding cybersecurity. And they uh, summarize the cybersecurity incident process in three different phases. The first is prepare, then we have uh, respond, and the last one is follow up. On the first phase, you will need to understand you to have uh, uh, the e-discovery process. In other words, you will need to understand uh, what kind of, of systems you are dealing with. If you have electronic data, do you have that electronic electronic data classified, or do you have something important to worry about? Do you have uh, controls? Do you have administrative or technical or physical controls to protect your assets? You have, for example, a business a business impact analysis that will allow you to understand what happens is if a certain system goes down, how much how much money you will lose, how uh, how much time you will lose on your operation, for example. As soon as you have all the information in your hand, if you uh, as soon as you have all the data, you could start uh, dealing with the incident. So. First of all, in the phase two, you, you will need to identify what is a cybersecurity incident. So, for example, if somebody came here into your office and left a USB key on your desk and you grab the USB key and plug it into your computer 
and you download a malware into your computer, that's probably a security incident. But if somebody goes and, and, and for example, uh, crash a window uh, in your building because throw a rock, that's probably not a security incident. That's probably, well, it's a security incident, but not a cybersecurity incident. So the way that you are going to deal with a cybersecurity incident will be different than the way that you are dealing with another kind of security, uh, another kind of incident in your organization. Then you, you will need to start or trigger the business recovery plan. You will start, or you probably you will need to trigger the business continuity plan if the incident may require that. But the last part is the session of everything about uh, on the post incident or the investigation phase. And that's actually the follow up. You will to investigate the incident, why the incident happened, if the incident, incident will happen again, how you will deal with the incident, what, what are the best controls that you could implement in order to prevent the incident that will that happen again. So uh, there, there is a lot of things that you could do on the follow up. Other thing that it's important to understand or do in the follow-up phase is the trend analysis. So, for example, you know that somebody in your organization grab a USB key and plug it into into a computer in the internal network, and a malware goes through all your network and infects a lot of computer. So, probably it's trend. If somebody uh, again goes and and leave USB keys on the parking lot, for example, what is the probability, what is the trend that, that a lot of people, a lot, a lot of your users will grab the same USB key, will go and plug the USB key into your computer. So in order to understand that that kind of activity, that kind of behavior will be a trend, you have to uh, probably perform a lot of interviews. You will have to go and grab enough evidence, as we mentioned on the investigation uh, uh, phase, and create a case, create a business case, create a process, create a plan. And one of the outcomes of that plan probably will be a security awareness problem. So that's basically the, the, the phases of the cyber, of cyber incident response uh, uh, plan, cyber incident response process. Something good, if you want to understand a little bit better how a security incident could harm your organization, is this data breach calculator that we have here in IBM. Actually, let's go real quick into this link. If you go here and open this link, you will get something like this. And actually, it's pretty, pretty simple. You just need to uh, select here, for example, in what country do you, uh, you are living or the cybersecurity incident will, will be happening. Uh, what kind of industry are you dealing with? For example, we could deal with the pharmaceutical industry. And some of the things that you already implement or you don't have on your, uh, on your organization, for example, you could say that you have a, uh, an artificial intelligence platform and you have actually a data classification schema and you have employee training. And see, as soon as I start adding new things into this uh, factors, the number or the cost of the cybersecurity incident will low. As soon as start, I start clicking on the on the factors and delete delete the, the factors from the link here from box that I have, the cybersecurity incident will will be higher. Will be the cost will be higher. And then here we have the normal statistics about how uh, based again on our location the average time to identify a cybersecurity breach, a data breach, for example, and uh, the top three uh, cost-producing factors of, uh, for mitigating data security breaches. So obviously the first one is incident response. Then we have a lot of, uh, or the use of uh, encryption technologies in our uh, data and our systems, and obviously the employee training process. And on the next, slide we have a couple of a couple of links also if you uh, prefer to understand the cybersecurity incident process using a minimap you could go to those links those are actually pretty good but you, you will have a lot of information here you will see a lot of things and probably will be overwhelming to understand this but that that's actually pretty, pretty cool uh, you will have 
here are a lot of phases, a lot of steps that you will need to perform as soon as you start or dealing with the cybersecurity incident response. So, for example, here on the step, step number three, this is the steps that you may need to follow on the initial response process. So, the first step on the initial response, for example, is deciding is uh, have the system and network administrator in place, the business personnel examining the logs, the reports, your uh, architecture, and should have, for example, information gathering for the system, understand the incident that you are dealing with, understand the system that you are dealing with in order to start working with the, with the response team, start working with, a, with, a, with the people. In this video, you will learn to describe the purpose of frameworks, baselines, and best practices in an effective cybersecurity strategy. And uh, the last part of this session is frameworks and their uh, purposes. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, frameworks, we're going, to tell, we're going to talk about best practices, and here is just a good differ differentiation between best practices, baseline frameworks, normative, and compliance. So in the organization, we, have, uh, we will have a lot of things. We will have, for example, uh, best practices. We will have a baseline or we will have framework. A good example of framework is COVID, or a good example of uh, best practices. In some cases, framework, it depends on your uh, business, is ITIL, ITIL. So those are good things, good controls, that will improve, enhance your IT governance, your IT processes, your IT policy, uh, policies, your IT procedures, those frameworks, those baselines, those uh, best practices will uh, improve the performance of your servers. For example, if you go and grab the best practices for Microsoft regarding, regarding the hardening of their uh, database server, for example, uh, you will have a best Microsoft SQL server. You will have an improved Microsoft SQL server. But, but that best practice, that framework is not something that you will have to have. It's nice to have. You will have a lot of good practices. You will have a lot of controls. You will have a lot of good things. But if you don't have it, that's, that's good. That's something that will, uh, will not necessarily harm your business. If you don't have guidelines from Microsoft to implement the servers, if you don't have the guidelines from uh, Cisco to implement the, uh, the Cisco devices, if you don't have uh, the best practices, from uh, COVID to improve your uh, IT governance in your company, uh, you won't uh, lose your business. You won't be part of any kind of problem with your regulator, with your uh, government. In the other corner, we have normative and compliance. The difference here is you need to implement normative, you need to have uh, compliance if your business required that. So for example, there is something called HIPAA. HIPAA is a normative that will be part of any kind of healthcare company in the United States. So you could have in your healthcare company, you could have COVID, you could have a lot of ITIL processes, you could have all the best practices from your vendors implemented in your systems. But if you don't meet, if you don't comply, if you don't comply with, with HIPAA, if you miss two points, if you miss two processes in HIPAA, probably you won't operate in the United States. You will have penalties from uh, the U.S. government because you are not complying with HIPAA. So that's the main difference between baselines, frameworks, and best practices, and normative and compliance. So as we mentioned, we have a lot of things. We have, for example, as best practices, as frameworks, methodologies uh, that we could implement in our business to improve the way that our business deal, deals with technology. And we could mention, I, I actually we already mentioned a couple of those. We, we could mention COVID, we could mention ITIL, ISOs uh, on cybersecurity. We have uh, ISO 27,000 uh, series. We have COSO. 
we have the PMI, the Project Management Institute, with a lot of project management methodologies. Uh, we have the developer recommendations. As soon as you start working with a network or sorry, with a with a programming languages, you you will have a lot of documentations. You will have a lot of uh, information regarding the best practices that you could follow on your uh, uh, software in your systems to avoid any kind of uh, security incidents, any kind of incident that will will harm or will uh, destroy your your software. In this video, you will learn to describe what is meant by an IT governance process, what components are involved, and why it is important. We have uh, the things that are part of our organization that are something uh, good to have, good to understand, and well, it's good to have, but in most of the cases are necessarily to have. We have a strategic, and, a strategic and tactic plans. That kind of plans would set all the direction of the organization or the uh, structure of each of the departments. And each department will try to obtain the goals using the strategic plan because the strategic plan will tell you what is the course of the, of the, of the company. If the company wants to grow, for example, 20% uh, in the next two years selling computers, well, probably all the departments inside our company needs to focus this, uh, their efforts to, to accomplish that strategic goal. The tactic plans are how could we accomplish the strategic part. So that's, uh, those two plans are uh, hand by hand. So that's also important to understand. Policies, policies are actually pretty important. You will need to have a policy to set the baseline, to set the, the, the structure of process that you want to, to, to have. So for example, here is a quick example. You have in your business internet access for your users. So first thing that you have, uh, that you have to have, or you have to have, or you need to have actually, <laughs> is the policy how the users will access the internet, what the users can do and cannot do on the internet. So a policy, internet, a user internet policy should be in place for let the users know what they cannot do and what they can do. Now, there is a procedure. A procedure is, for example, what a new user should do in order to have internet. So uh, it doesn't matter at this point, for example, in a procedure, if the user can go to a sports website and watch a game, but the procedure, this scenario will uh, allow the user to request internet access to the IT staff, for example. As soon as the user has have uh, internet access, the user will uh, probably prompt to read the internet usage policy and the user will need to accept the policy in order to get internet access. That's something we normally use or we normally experiment on the public internet uh, access locations. So for example, if you go to, if you go to Starbucks and you start or you start or, or you're trying to, or you try, you are trying to use the, the internet access from Starbucks, as soon as you connect to a Wi-Fi network, you will receive a captive portal with a lot of information, a lot of data that say that says, in other words, that all the information, all the uh, data that, that you are going to send into using that that Wi-Fi connection will be or will be the Starbucks start, will will not have any responsible or responsibility on that. So that's a quick example of what is a policy and what is a procedure. A procedure is again the process that you need to follow in order to have something, in order to perform something. And the policy is simply the rules that you will need to understand, that you will need to accept to start using your computer, your internet, your device. Governance, governance is the understanding of all the different parts of the organization with a simple goal, with single, and well, not necessarily a single, with a one unique goal. So for example, COVID is a good framework that will allow your company to improve the IT governance in your organization because all the different parts of the organization will talk the same language. So for example, if somebody in accounting needs 
a modification on the payroll system because they found uh, they found a bug. They know that uh, if they want a modification in the system, they will need to, for example, go to the internet and create a ticket number, create a, an incident case. That incident will go to the IT staff, and the IT staff will priori- uh, prioritize uh, the incident into into the queue to be treated by the experts. That that's something actually pretty standard, but everything that I mentioned, it's part of the IT governance process. That's something that may correspond to a change management process, to a delivery and support process from your uh, IT staff. And that's a good example uh, of, of how your accounting department that probably doesn't have anything to do with technology uh, needs to understand and talk the same language that's your IT department in order to both departments have the same goals. In this video, you will learn to describe which compliance policies most organizations are required to follow, describe the use of audits in cybersecurity compliance. And regarding compliance, here's a quick example of a couple of uh, regulations or compliance uh, policies that most of the organizations in the United States or in other parts of the world needs to to have or to implement in order to operate in certain countries. So, for example, we have SOX. SOX is a financial compliance or financial regulation program. HIPAA, we already mentioned HIPAA. It's something related to healthcare, how the healthcare or organizations deal with the private uh, privacy of data of the patients, for example, how they transmit the data between hospitals, different healthcare organizations, and if, for example, if they transmit the information in a secure way, for example. DLBA is something related to finance, and PCI DSS is uh, related to the manage of uh, credit cards, of uh, financial processes. So if you want, for example, to start processing credit cards on your uh, servers because you have a store, an online store, probably you will need to comply with PCI DSS. Uh, normally, a lot of companies that deals with PCI DSS, it's to perform, for example, a pen test or vulnerability assessment on a regular basis for them to comply with PCI DSS. So here are some just examples for the compliance. And the last part, uh, one, one of the last parts that are important to understand is uh, the main difference between the process that any organization could perform in order to identify if they are compliant with a certain a regulation or a certain, a certain framework that they want to implement. Uh, one of the things that they need to perform is an audit. Now, an audit could be an internal audit or it could be an external audit. The internal audit, obviously, is performed by, by internal departments, uh, by the internal, the internal audit department. And that's uh, something normal in most of the organizations. That's a continuum process. That's something that is uh, normally performed during all the year, during all the life cycle. Uh, but the, the difference here is normally the internal departments will uh, generate reports, but those reports are necessarily to improve the operation of the organization. The external audits are uh, normally based on requirements. So, for example, if you want to comply with PCI DSS, you will need to hire an external audit company to uh, generate a report and understand in which of the PCI DSS parts you are not complying. Or if you are complying in all the PCI DSS parts, well, the external, co- the external company will let you know in the report that you are able or you, you, you can go now and apply for a PCI DSS uh, certification or process to be a part of or to start uh, dealing with credit cards, credit cards, for example. Now, here is a, a, a methodology uh, you could use. You could use in your audit project, for example. But basically, and this process could apply for external and internal audits, but are um, actually pretty simple. Three phases. Uh, but inside each of the phases, you will have a bunch of uh, steps 
And again, this is something standard, so it not necessarily means that the same methodology will, will be applied or will be valid for all the organization. But this is just the baseline. So on phase one, you will have to understand the, the organization view. You will need to understand the organization that you are dealing with. You will need to identify the key players, the key users, for example, of the system in order to start looking for any kind of, of finding, any kind of, of uh, incident or issue that you may report in your final audit report. Also, you will need to create a profile. You will need to create a threat profile. For example, if you are auditing a software, you will need to understand, well, this is a, a web-based software, and one of the threats that this software could, could have is a cross-site scripting attack. So it doesn't mean that the software that you are auditing right now is prompt to or have an issue regarding cross-site scripting, but that's something that in phase number two and phase number th number three, you will need to assess and you will need to identify. So again, if you know that you are dealing with a, a web page or the web software will be prompt to a cross-site scripting attack on phase number two, you will need to evaluate, you will need to understand and you will need to test or probably interview to the creators of the software and ask if they already uh, perform any kind of, uh, for example, uh, security review on the, on the web system, on the web application, and the results of the review will, uh, for example, have something regarding cross-site scripting. If not, if there is any kind of security assessment, any kind of security review for that uh, web system, probably uh, you will need to create your own test, your own assessment, or you will need to inform, inform on your report that this software doesn't have any kind of security assessment, any kind of security review that will guarantee that it's bulletproof, for example. And the last part is the risk assessment, the risk analysis. That process will uh, translate all your fund findings in your audit report into a risk. This could be, for example, the, the, on the, um, the example that we are talking about, about the cross-site scripting, if you detect that any, uh, any or, uh, if you detect that the organization is not performing any kind of security assessment and you don't have any kind of inputs or any kind of evidence that will let you know that, yes, the software is not uh, prompt to uh, cross-site scripting, well, you need to categorize the finding into a risk. Is this a high risk for your organization? Well, if your business depends on uh, on that web system, probably it's a high it's a high risk. Probably it's a critical risk. So you will need to understand. You will need to translate those findings into risk. In this video, you will learn to describe a penetration testing process, mile two CPTE training, and what is meant by ethical hacking. Uh, part of this session is the penetration testing process, the penetration testing uh, phases that uh, in the audit, we just understand, for example, that we don't have on the web system, we don't have any assessment yet uh, to understand or to review if the system is prompt to cross-site scripting. Well, on the pen testing site, uh, we will go and we will test the cross-site scripting into the system. We will act like uh, like an attacker, like an, a hacker, and try to exploit the system, try to perform the cross-site scripting and understand what happens. Understand if the system is uh, prompt to cross-site scripting, well, let's simulate, let's attack the system, let's generate a cross-site scripting uh, attack into the system and let's see what happens. Let's see if the system, let me, let me send a message to a user and let me uh, trick the user to go to an external website and try to uh, hack the user computer, try to hack the system. So basically the penetration testing or the ethical hacking process, this is just a methodology used by mil 2 It's a, a vendor that has a lot of cybersecurity uh, certification. But this is just a, a basic and a standard process. So you will need to footprint in your, your target on the same target that we have, the web application program, we will need to understand, first of all, 
what kind of system we are dealing with. If this is a web system, we're dealing with a WordPress uh, platform, we're dealing with a customized platform, we're dealing with a HTML5 platform. The scanning process will uh, will let, let us know, or in the uh, pen tester uh, view, will the pen tester uh, um, will give the pen tester the knowledge to understand if there is if there is any port open what is the operative system of, of the of the web uh, server application what is the uh, language what is the database that the web uh, application is reporting to on the enumeration we will understand any kind of techniques any kind of processes that we are going to generate that we are going to use uh, for yep. the test system and obviously we have the exploitation or penetration part and this means that we are going to perform the attacks we are going to generate the attacks if we understand that we are dealing with a wordpress platform and the wordpress platform is is on a server in the internal network and the same uh, word uh, wordpress platform prompts to a sql injection attack and we could get the information for the database well let's generate the attack let's uh, create the attack and see what happened. If the attack was success successful, we will have to perform a set of, of steps. For example, we could elevate the privilege. Uh, we could manipulate the, the data. We we need to cover our tracks. For example, we don't want for the sysad or we don't want the sysadmin to to detect our steps in the system. So probably we will need to, we will need to cover our track. And we will uh, have to leave a backdoor. For example, if we want to come back later into the system, uh, we don't want to perform any any of the previous steps. We just want to go and double click on the link in in our desktop and get access to the system. Uh, then we will need to leave a backdoor. Those processes, those steps, will uh, understand or will give us an understand that the system is prompt to attacks and not just prompt to attack but the system will have or will uh, deal with attack in a way that will give the attacker the full control of the system or will uh, block the attack and will uh, drop all the connections from the attacker computer so that's 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 pro that that process the pentest process is normally known as an offensive uh, security scan is something that you will need to act like an attacker you will need to act as an uh, as a hacker and perform uh, attacks into systems obviously you will need to have permission from your client in order to proceed with this kind of of of, of test but on the audit and the, the the important part here is understand that if you will perform an audit this is not necessarily a pen test or a pen test is not necessarily an, an audit so there is a lot of differences there is a lot of things that you you will keep in mind in order to perform each of both or each of the of the of the processes each of the of the techniques that we show you in this session in this video you will learn to describe the OWASP top 10 tests when and why they are used and where to get help from outside organizations Another methodology, another best practice that most of the web applications needs to follow. Here's the OWASP top 10 process. So if you are if you're dealing with a web page, if you're dealing with a web application, if you're dealing with actually not necessarily a web application, but if you're dealing with applications at all, you could use the OWASP top 10 and start performing tests on each of the sections that these organization will have on their on their website. So basically, OWASP, and we will see here uh, a lot of a lot of information on OWASP. If you go to uh, Google and put OWASP on the search bar, you will go to the to the OWASP.org link, and you will get a lot of information regarding these organization that will help you when you are trying to perform a test into your application, into your web application. Actually, there is also a lot of information for mobile applications too. So for example, if you, if you go to, to downloads, you will see a lot of categories here. So for example, let's go to the top 10, top 10 project here, yeah. And you will see that the 10, uh, top 10 for 2017, 
it's now available. So here you will download the report with all the different uh, information for the top 10 vulnerabilities for uh, the web applications on the last two, three years since two, seven, uh, 2017. So for example, we have as a number one injection. So if we go to page number seven, here's an example of what is, what is injection? What is the process to uh, get information from the system uh, using SQL injection, for example? What are the attack scenarios? What are, what are the queries that you need to perform in the system in order to know if your system is prompt or is vulnerable to injection? And you have, for example, here broken authentication, sensitive data exposure. You have a lot of things to test, a lot of things to prove. And uh, again, if you go to the main website, you will see a lot of downloads. There's something else known as the checklist. It's a document where you will get a lot of documents, a lot of a lot of controls that you will need to implement, you will need to have on your web applications in order to ensure that your system, your web app is fu uh, fully secure. 